So today I'm going to talk about the evolution of youth sociality from a life cycle perspective. And I'd like to start first talking about a different major transition, the evolutionary transition to multicellularity. Parallels between multicellularity and eusociality have been drawn before to understand the evolutionary process that lead to these evolutionary transitions. In this particular case, I'd like to emphasize the perspective proposed by these two authors, where they argue that it is important to understand the life cycles of the solitary or single-celled ancestors in order to understand the process of the evolution of multicellularity. In this particular case, we have here as an example the social amoeba dictostelium discudeo. The hypothesized life cycle shows a species that switches between two different stages, the, the feeding stage amoeba and the cyst. And it seems that the molecular mechanisms that were used by this single cell ancestor to go from these two different, between these two different stages was co-opted in the social amoeba to switch between the solitary uh, stage and the aggregation stage. So taking into account this perspective, I'd like to start talking about uh, the life cycle of solitary insects. So first I'd like to talk about the female hibernation life cycle. And let me briefly explain you what the female hibernation life cycle is. In this life cycle, we start with females that were mated from the season before, and these females produce one first brood in the summer and another brood in the fall. These two broods are, of course, composed of males and females. And then the females in this second brood, after mating, they go on to, into diapause over winter and start a new life cycle again in the spring of the next of the following year. In contrast, we have here a different life cycle, also from a solitary insect, where the main difference is that the females or foundresses do not start the season mated, but rather both males and females overwinter in the larval stage. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of this second life cycle, but I'd like to go back to the female hibernation life cycle. And I'd like to stress the fact that these different types of individuals that we have along the life cycle might have different potential reproductive opportunities. Particularly, let's look at these males here in the first brood of in the summer. These males, if they survive long enough all the way to the fall, they can potentially mate with individuals from the second brood, with females from the second brood. This would, of course, cause a bias in the operational sex ratio of this second brood. As we know from sex ratio theory, Sex ratio biases imply that the sex in the minority has a higher reproductive potential. So these females that are here would have a higher reproductive value compared to the females in the fall, but also compared to the males in, in their own brood. And this means that if foundresses had the potential to bias these different broods in different directions, they would bias the first brood towards the male side and the second brood towards the female side. Now, if we assume that these individuals have a haplodiploid form of sex determination, that means that this second brood that is female bias has a higher relatedness to the females from the first brood. So if we were to ask whether it's a good strategic option for these females to stay in their mother nest, or go their own reproduction and go on to raise a brood of siblings that are more related to themselves than their own offspring, this would depend basically on a set of traits that are part of the narrative of the life cycle that I've given you so far. I'd like to stress these traits, particularly female hibernation, the form of Bible time life cycle, where you produce two broods in a single reproductive season, sex ratio manipulations where females can produce different sex ratios in the two groups that they produce, haplodiploidy, the sex determination system, and monogamy. So what I want to do here is I'm gonna try to I'm I'm gonna try to answer questions about the evolution of eusociality using an evolutionary model in the context of this solitary life cycle. And the questions I want to address are is eusociality favored by a specific combination of pre-adaptations? like the ones that I just mentioned, 
And what is the effect of the coevolution of sex ratio on health? So in order to answer particularly the first question, we need to compare different scenarios for the evolution of human sociality. And to do that, I'm going to use this parameter B. So I need to assume some benefits that workers provide to their mothers, to their mother's nests. So I'm going to assume that these benefits, the fecundity benefits, scale linearly with the number of workers. This is the linear equation that I have here. And this parameter B in this equation represents the benefits that each worker bring, brings in fecundity, in a fecundity sense, to the, to the nest of their mother. Now, this parameter B has a clear demographic interpretation. If B is one, that means these workers are as efficient at raising siblings as at raising their own offspring. If B is larger than one, they're more efficient at raising siblings, and B is below one, they're more efficient at raising their own offspring. So taking this into account, I'm gonna use the minimal requirements for the evolution of U-sociality, capital B, as a, as a way to compare different scenarios. Obviously, the lower, the, the smaller the benefits required for the evolution of your sociality, the more beneficial is one scenario to bring about this evolutionary transition. Now, precisely, this is what I show here in this graph. In the x-axis, we have this capital B, the required benefits for the evolution of the worker trait. And in the y-axis here, we have the male survival parameters that I highlighted in the solitary life cycle. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start systematically adding traits, pre-adaptations, to see the effect that they have on these um, minimal requirements for the evolution of the worker trait. And I start here with a polyandric case, so females mate with different males, with many males, sorry, and we see here that the minimal requirements for the evolution of your sociality need to be larger than two for this for, the, for natural selection to favor the worker trait. If I now add monogamy, you see that the benefits only need to be larger than one. Now, if I add more pre-adaptations, in this case, I add haplodiploidy and female hibernation, we see suddenly that the requirements necessary for the evolution of the worker trait scale with the male survival parameter. Particularly, they re the male survival parameter reduces the minimal requirements for the evolution of sociality. If I add the last pre-adaptation, sex ratio flexibility, you, you see here that there's a considerable decrease in the benefits required for the evolution of your sociality. So parenthesis here, these two lines here that are on the right-hand side of the vertical line correspond to the second life cycle that I presented you in an earlier slide. So what we see here is basically that this set of pre-adaptations certainly favor the evolution of sociality. Now let's go on to the second question. What is the effect of the coevolution of sex ratios on helping? So here I am gonna present you some evolutionary simulations. We have here on the x-axis, the time, evolutionary time, and on the uh, y-axis, we have the phenotypic value of the three traits that are of our interest, spring sex ratio, summer sex ratio, and helping behavior. Now, if we allow for this sex ratio evolution, we see uh, our verbal prediction that the first brood becomes male bias and the second brood becomes female bias. Now, if I allow for the evolution of the worker trait or the helping trait, we see that helping evolves all the way to the higher levels. But interestingly, this evolution feeds back on the, the sex ratio. So we see now that the first brood suddenly becomes completely female bias. And we can understand that because now that these females are staying and becoming workers, then it's in the interest of the founders of the nest to have more workers. And the second brood goes back to being even now that there are no males being produced in the first brood. Now, these evolutionary dynamics in practice are showing us an evolutionary transition from this solitary life cycle here on the left to this uh, life cycle on the right. That is no longer a bivoltine solitary life cycle, but rather it's a univoltine eusocial life cycle, where the first brood is composed entirely of workers and the second brood composed of reproductives. Now I'd like to highlight the fact that these results, this evolutionary scenario is not contradictory to 
developmental theories of the origin of the worker trait. In particular, the diapos ground plan hypothesis proposes that if we have a solitary life cycle like the one that I proposed, and the females in the second group need to overwinter, they develop slightly different uh, life history and metabolic characters compared to the females in the first group. Particularly these females here in red, they have a long lifespan, they have more fat and protein storage, and they get more larval nourishment. Now this polyphenism, we can, so the hypothesis proposes that this polyphenism was co-opted to develop the polyphenism in the eusocial, in the eusocial colonies, where the second females of this, the females of the second brood, they go on to produce to be the queens or the founders of these nests or the giants, while the females in the first brood, they go on to be workers. And these different characters that we see here in life, in metabolic metabolism and um, life history are maintained also in the polyphonism of social behavior. So uh, now I'd like to also show you that this model can be extended to include other types of social traits. In this particular case, what we did is that we allowed workers to have some leverage in the this in the sex ratio determination of the of the reproductive route. Basically we allowed these workers to to perform bovisa, that is to kill male legs in order to bias the sex ratio of the brute toward the female side. Now in this panel um in the upper part, we see that ovicide, this um, represented by this purple line, effectively evolves in these conditions that we have here. The worker trait also evolves, but it produces a polymorphism in worker behavior. So there are some nests that are solitary and some other nests that are social. Interestingly, this has, this has important consequences in the sex ratio. Now, solitary nests are only producing the males of the population and the females are all produced by the social nest. So in practice, this means that we have split sex ratios, not only in time due to these two different routes, but also in space, the solitary and the social nest. In the panel below, we see a similar uh, pattern, but in this case, there are no social and solitary nests because the worker trade has evolved to much higher levels. Nevertheless, we have sex ratios split again. So we have in here, the production of a uh, split distribution of genotypes where some nests produce uh, males and some nests produce only females. Finally, I'd like to emphasize the fact that this Bible time life cycle, um, where there is an overwintering period, creates a situation in which there's a reduced kin competition for taking control over the reproduction of the groups. This is not what happens in a life cycle that um, it's more akin to tropical environments where there is a continuous reproduction throughout the year. In those cases, workers have the potential to replace, to replace the main reproductive of the nest. And we show in this recent model here, that this has an important effect in the evolution of these life cycles. Basically, we show that direct fitness benefits are much more important for the evolution of cooperative breeding compared to the more tempered life cycle that I've presented you so far. Um, now, with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators in this work. Uh, thank you for listening.